Hey everybody and welcome to our 2020 Clean SEO Strategy Webinar. This is where we're going to lay out the very basic fundamentals of everything we're doing to get traffic to our websites. Our webinar last year got almost 700,000 views to it. And this is really where like you got to give us time. This is, you know, give us 45 minutes. This is going to be a, an in-depth presentation, but you can either give 45 minutes now and really learn these things, or you can spend years floundering and making mistakes with Google that are going to kill your website. Exactly. This webinar is a lot of years in the making. We've, we've spent a lot of time figuring a lot, uh, a lot of things on our own. Over the last year, since the last webinar, we have built up a portfolio of websites. Um, we just sold a portfolio of six of our websites for over half a million dollars. Um, just going to show exactly what can still be done today. There's still a ton of opportunity for bloggers today. And we've, those were all new sites. We've yeah. built lots of them in the past. That was just a new batch just in the last year. What we're doing to get traffic is working. And exactly. that's what we want to share. Building up sites from zero to 100,000 plus page views within a year. Mm -hmm. Getting tens of millions of page views on our organic page views coming straight from search. It's just phenomenal what can still be done in blogging today. Especially what is starting, you know, at kind of this stage of my career, what's getting me much more excited is what we're seeing our customers doing. Yes. The people, the members of, of Project 24, I mean, almost every week, and sometimes more than one a week, uh, we're getting a new member hitting the thousand dollars a month mark or the full-time income mark. Um, like they're they're succeeding. Not all of them, but that's an important thing to know. Most of you who start a blog will fail. It's hard it to is. to do everything right enough to get that traffic. There are so many places where you can mess it up. And so that's what we're trying to show you in this webinar. This webinar is going to walk you through numerous ways that you can bypass all of that. Mm -hmm. we've, I've, we've worked with many customers who've said, I've spent over a decade trying to figure this out on my own and I've never had success. But now that I have a system, a framework, a, a series of processes, I'm able to do it. So in this webinar, we want to walk you through some of these systems relative to SEO and how we get organic traffic from search. And so today we're going to talk a bit about how Google actually works. We're going to talk about um, uh, th the most important aspects of SEO, which are relevance. And then we'll talk about on-page SEO and off-page SEO. <sighs> I'm excited to get going. <laughs> All right. So most of this is based off of what's been, been termed the QRG now, the Quality Rater Guidelines. So this was several years ago. Google hired a lot, I mean yeah. thousands of individual actual human beings to go website by website and answer survey questions about those websites. So it was getting a human view about how well a website was matching the search, the reputation of that site, etc. And we don't know exactly how Google is using this data. If that, that army of people, I mean thousands of people that they're still employing to do this, mm -hmm. is it used to manually rank those websites? Is it more for data validation on an AI? Google has really been cagey about exactly what they do here. Um, they've given us a couple little clues, but we just don't really know. The point though is it doesn't matter. The point is that Google has released a document for their quality raters that basically is saying, this is what we want the perfect website to be. And they hire thousands of engineers and they're one of the most powerful companies on planet Earth with one goal, how do we figure out which websites match that document? Because they're gonna be the best search result for the people, like that's their product is Google search, right? And they wanna to, to bring the best result every time. And so this document is absolute gold, nay <laughs> platinum, I might say. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is great. So what we're teaching you is not theory, it is not philosophy, it is what Google is saying that we have actually Verified. seen work yeah. ourselves. So since we made this webinar a year ago talking from the QRG, 
Google has made an update to mm -hmm. the QRG. A couple even. Yeah, there are some specific things that have changed that we'll talk about here in this webinar. But if you wanna go read that QRG, just go to incomeschool.com slash QRG and go check it out for yourself. Quirk. <laughs> Quirk. <laughs> we just coined a new word. <laughs> Let's talk about Google's top ranking factors. Now, this, this is tricky, right? Mm -hmm. Google has, they've said many times, and everybody cites this number, that there are over 200 factors that Google uses to rank content. And so some of these ranking factors are high level. They're the most important things, but they're being measured by many other ranking factors as well. And so there's there's a little bit of both there. So the number one ranking factor, bar none, is relevancy, which is Makes kind sense. of obvious, right? Like, it doesn't matter how good your article is on weight loss. If somebody searched, you know, how do I cut down a tree, you know? <laughs> it doesn't um, matter. <laughs> so that, that's obvious, right? Except that it's not. When a new blogger starts writing, they tend to write articles that are just getting things off their chest. Yeah. I have a tip to share. I want to went on this amazing trip. It's a blog, like it's a log of their life, yep. right? And that will not work. You have to be relevant to a specific search. So that is the number one ranking factor by far. Yep. The second one, and this is a ranking factor that ties into other ranking factors, but quality backlinks to your website. Mm -hmm. um, Google has specifically said the, that quality backlinks is one of their top few uh, ranking guidelines. And so what this means is other websites, other um, relevant websites with some authority on the subject are linking back to your content basically giving you a score of reputation, of level of authority. And when somebody space. links to your website, it's kind of like a vote for, hey, that was cool content. Yeah. So and we'll Google talk, is looking we'll at that. We'll talk more and more about backlinks later on in this as well. But Because our approach is very, very non-traditional. Mm -hmm. Very non-traditional from what I think hardly anyone else in the industry does. And it's clearly working. All right, next is user experience. So there may be a lot of different ways that Google is looking at this, but they have the data from Google Chrome, from Android devices, uh, from just Google search and itself. And every blogger that's using Google Analytics. Yeah, it's just <laughs> they have the data yeah. on how long somebody stays on the page, which, are, which article they're clicking into on the search results, which search results satisfied their search, and they're like, okay, I, they've actually found the answer. So user happiness of like actually having a good experience on your site, really tough to game. And it's one of the top ranking factors. They're using that to say, what is a good result? Another one is EAT, that Google coined this term EAT, right? This is expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. I mentioned that backlinks was essentially a measurement for, for the more important ranking factor, which is this one. Um, and so backlinks is one measure of that, but there are numerous other ways that Google is using to try to determine the expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness of the, of the author and of the website. Those are actually two different things. And so we'll talk in this webinar about specifically how we go about establishing EAT on our sites. There are myriad other factors, as we mentioned, but some of the other leading ones were just use of images on the page, um, outbound links, like where do you link to? Yeah. Do you link to sp spammy crap site? Well, maybe you're one yourself, <laughs> right? Uh, the content age, you know, older content has had more time in the algorithm, but it's too old and suddenly it's not relevant anymore. Social signals, you know, does this site have a big community of people around it? That kind of tells me maybe this has more reputation. And the site structure, some of the things you do on the, on the page itself. So there's a lot of factors, but we need to talk about that age part. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's, this is really cool. <laughs> there's this, this patent that certainly did not get the airtime it deserved. Um, where Google has, we can see, we can read the patent that talks about how long it actually takes to rank on Google. And it's talking about the way that it does that, yeah. that we call stepped rankings. That initially when a piece of content is released, it's kind of making its, 
its initial look at it of just like, where should this rank? Should we even give this a shot with users, etc.? Yeah. What is the reputation of this website? It's kind of getting an initial ranking. And then it's continuing with further tests down the line, probably user testing, maybe a manual uh, quality checker. There's a lot that goes into that, the algorithm that may take time. Exactly. And so what we see when we write a new piece of content is a ghost town, <laughs> absolutely nothing. And when we started this last batch of sites that we created and sold, um, it, it's so disheartening when you yeah. start a blog and like even though we've done it dozens of times now, built sites to success, like still when you're writing new content and you're just like, oh my gosh, three people came to my blog today. It's really hard to see the future. But once you understand that it's gonna be about eight months before you really see that hockey stick growth, when that content really is taking off, where it's had enough time for other people to find you and link to you and do the user testing, we really see a big jump at the eight month mark in content, uh, in rankings, and it continues to grow even to a year and a half. So it's easy to quit way too soon on your blog. If you're starting today, you got to commit. You got to commit to a year of this process and you may be doing everything right and when you are following a good system that you have confidence is you're doing it well, you can continue to make that content because you know it's going to work. Exactly. And it's important to understand the that the stepped ranking system, this stepped um, measurement system is happening. Um, because with a brand new website, yes, it's going to take that long, but with an established site, where you've already gained some credibility in a particular industry, Google is able to shortcut through that ranking process. Now, a big mistake a lot of people make is in order to shortcut that process on a new site, they try to do things to manipulate the way Google's measuring the authoritativeness of a website, um, like a lot of link building uh, strategies that people are using today. And those can work in the short term to kind of trick Google into shortcutting some of those steps mm -hmm. because they, they see these signals. But what happens is, that down the line at some point, Google is able to recognize that it was shortcutted, that that authoritativeness that you've built up is fake, and then you get a manual penalty on your website. And so now you're outside the system. You're no longer in that normal stepped ranking process. You're kind of just hammered down for a long time. Let's talk about relevance. It's the number one ranking factor, and I think because it seems so obvious, so easy to skip over, but there is a lot to learn in relevance. We're also going to talk about search analysis here. Yes. So you have to write content that matches a search. If you start your blog uh, on building a home and you write something like, I built my home in just five months and four days. The only search that ranks for is, how long did it take Jim Harmer to build his home? <laughs> the Nobody only cares. Search in that is Jim's mom. And you know? the reason, <laughs> and my mom searches a lot. She does. <laughs> uh, the only, the reason that people do that is one, they just have things they want to share, but two, that's the kind of content we see all the time on social media. It's yes. what we see on YouTube. It's that viral kind of content that fails on Google search. Google search wants you to answer his or her question. And so you have to think, what's a question that somebody's typing into Google? And then decide what content you're gonna create that is the perfect answer to that. Get that in your head. If you fail to remember this lesson, you can do everything else right and your blog will be dead a year from now. What most people do in order to create content that they believe will rank is they rely on, a ser on several different tools. Um, there are, are many different tools out there available for, quote, keyword research. Um, and what these tools do is they're intended to give you an indication of how much search volume there is for a term. Essentially doing what we just told you you need. You need to create content geared toward a search. The problem is, well, there are multiple, but one is those tools are based on keywords and Google doesn't care about keywords. It's all about semantics. It's what is the intent behind the search. The words used in the search don't really matter anymore. Mm -hmm. The second problem is none of these tools have access to the same size of data set that Google has. Not even close, probably not even a millionth of the data that Google has. And because of that, they're extrapolating from the data sets they're able to put together. 
And so their numbers are typically very far off from reality, except for on high volume searches, which are usually the type of searches we're not anyway. going to create content on. So this is Ahrefs, SEM all Rush, of all of them, right? And it shocks people when we go speak around the industry and people say, well, you, what, you don't, you use, don't use the keyword <laughs> research tools no. for your keyword research. No, no, we don't at all. And actually, that's one of the secrets to why we're winning. <laughs> it's why we're winning. Yeah. All of our competitors are using the same faulty data. Yes. And we have done this. So they're all writing the same Dozens, content. hundreds of times <laughs> yeah. we have done this, where we take an article, found our way to do search analysis. We look it up in a keyword research tool and we say, what's the search volume? How many people search that? And it will say zero or 10 searches a month and or we'll five even, searches a month. We'll even look up numerous different wordings. Right, that like mean what are adjacent search. things like, that you could have. Yeah, it, it, we're just trying, it, trying to give it the most benefit of the doubt. And it just says like almost no one searches this. And then we actually go write the piece of content because our way shows like, I eh, know if there's search volume there, we actually go write it. And we've seen multiple times where it's bringing in 5,000 people a month from one Blog article yeah. that the tool tells us has no search volume. And so all your competitors are using that volume to determine what to write in your niche. What if there was a way to find out a completely different set of terms that are truly undervalued with little or no competition. Oh, I'm sounding like a salesman. <laughs> we gotta just show them. There is a way, Okay, and that's so, the point. We have an entire process called search analysis. It is, the entire process is way too in-depth for this webinar. We actually have an entire course on it in our membership, Project 24. And so Project 24 members have access to just- It's like two hours <laughs> of exactly how we do it. Followed by a very, very long over the shoulder video of Jim showing an example of exactly how to do this. And there's a lot to it. Um, but we can give you the quick um, yeah. few minute version here. And this may just blow your mind. If you don't, if you don't, there's the risk. A lot of people see this, and the and the risk is that they look at it and they say, "No, it's too simple. It's too simple. Yeah. It, there's no way it's that simple." And they write it off entirely. It is that simple, but it is the best method we've ever found for doing search analysis, um, which is just like keyword research 10.0. So right. when let's say I'm doing a website about like logging or forestry or you know proper you know having wooded property stuff like that. So if I want to know what are the big searches, Google has auto suggest. Like when you start typing something in the search bar, you know how it's like trying to complete the words for you? Well, obviously when, it, when it's guessing what the next word you're gonna type is, it's getting that from what other people have searched, right? Relative and it's to not what gonna wanna, it's not gonna wanna throw something really random and niche up there because that's right. probably not what you're trying to search. So they're giving away what the biggest searches the are. The top searches in based off of the few words you've already typed in. So if I start searching something like uh, cutting down a tree, um, I see an autocomplete with, of, with an ax and I'm like, Okay, cutting down a tree with an ax. Now I look there and I see, you know, there's quite a bit of comp competition of just how to do this, but I can go to the bottom and Google has this searches related to cutting down a tree with an ax. And now you see one that's really interesting. How long does it take to chop down a tree with an ax? And so we say, huh, Google tells me that people search that. And so I go to actually look at this, the number one result is a forum. Forums are the lowest form of content online. Um, they, anytime I see forums in the search results, I say low competition, I can beat that. Yeah. And then you look at the articles and they're, they're not, not about on how long. point. Yeah. It's about how to cut down with an ax, it's not about the time. And so that's the pattern. We're just doing partial searches with some of the words that people would use letting Google autocomplete, and then we actually do the search and see, you know, are there a lot of really big websites that have written this exact thing? Then that's competitive. When there's forums and not articles exactly on point, we say, ka-ching, that's, I know I'm gonna get page views from that. This is a beautiful process, and really, this is how we determine um, the topics that are going to be highly relevant to people's searches, and then that's how we measure the competition. There's there are many ways people will try to shortcut this using quote data and analytics, but those data sets, we just have not found anything 
that even comes close to a good measurement of competition and a good measurement of actual search volume other than this process. And it actually is very simple and very easy to do. It's just a little bit more manual. And to be clear, we subscribe to some of those tools. We yeah. use them, not for search analysis. Exactly. We use them like I want to track the links to my website and stuff. There are some Ahrefs, SEMrush, it's an awesome tool. Yep. They have a really cool things in They'll there. They'll search your website and look for broken links. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of stuff that they do a very good job of because you give them access to your site and they can see the whole thing. Yeah. Um, they, they have incredible tools, yes. but for search analysis, in our personal experience of using and trying them over and over and comparing it to this and actually writing the articles, this is what's giving us the actual results. And I've heard from many people in Project 24 who say, if all I got in Project 24 was search analysis, it was way more than worth it. Mm -hmm. um, this, this was the biggest game changer for me. Bar none. And the other thing they can do, the tools can do, is just kind of give you ideas of sure. areas to start searching for in Absolutely. this. Anyway, okay, so that's how we're doing it. Next, we got to talk on page. So on page SEO just means like what are you actually putting out, the content you're actually putting on the website. There is a lot to how you format and write that content to make it rank. Exactly. And so one of the big factors that we've that people talk about a lot when it comes to on-page SEO is just the length of the content. There is a bit of a correlation between the length of a blog post and how well it ranks, but that correlation can lead you to make a big mistake, and that would be to just write longer and longer and longer posts. What we have found has worked really, really well is to size the content length, but also just the depth of the content to the search query. There are a lot of search queries where the absolute best and highest ranking blog post is thousand words. Mm -hmm. There are other blog posts where the best, highest ranking blog post is 4,000 words. But what we find is that oftentimes the articles that are ranking because they're long are actually probably ranking because they're very in depth and that's what the searcher intended. And we find that there's a better way to outrank that content and to create a better user experience that's gonna out, that's just gonna do better. So what we teach our members is to write three different types of posts, response, staple, and pillar posts. A response post is around 1,250 words, a staple post is around 2,200 words, and a pillar post is about 3,500 words. And so the reason that we do this is not because you know, we think that the word count is uh, you know, directly a ranking signal, it's probably not, um, but instead that there are different buckets of types of queries and in-depthness that you should be trying to write on on your website so that you're hitting a good broadness of, of different types of searches that people make. And also you're creating some content that's easy to produce and quick and others that's really meaty and in-depth and can keep someone on the website. When we switch to doing this, having people write those three different types of blog posts, we saw huge gains, huge gains um, in the success of those websites. And we find that the order that we write these blog posts on a brand new website is actually very important as oh, well. This like, is like, this you hear this and it's just like, okay, somebody's okay, just yeah, saying cool. stuff. No, no, it no, no, took no. us years to learn these things. <laughs> to figure these things out ourselves. A brand new website is going to really struggle to rank for a competitive, meaty topic in an industry even if it has the best content, mm -hmm. just because it just takes more authority, it just takes some credibility for links. Google to, yeah, links, exactly. And so what we wanna do is find some good, quick wins. So we're going to answer very specific questions um, early on on a website, and so we're mostly gonna focus on those response posts that answer a specific question. This is huge. Yeah, so if you're writing about SUVs on your website, you know, before you write, what is the best SUV? That's a really Huge big keyword. Query. There are gonna be a lot of people that are going to go after that search query. It's gonna be extremely competitive. You're gonna have articles from cars.com and Edmunds and, and USA Today and all kinds of big sites writing about that. Yeah. So you, on this tiny little website, if you write that, you're about to get squashed, right? You're gonna get crushed. You don't stand a chance. But if instead I start my site by writing something like, a, how to replace the leaf spring in a 1992 uh, expedition, well, there may not be any other result for that on the whole web. And so Google's gotta give you a shot, right? Yep. 
And so it's that kind of thing that we're writing early on in the site's lifetime. And that's probably a bad example because that's probably too small, A little bit right? too small, but, but yeah. But we're working on those small search terms and writing quick response posts that you can finish in one hour, crank them out, um, and then Google starts saying, hey, this guy's got good information. He keeps ranking number one on Google. People like his website. And then they, you start ranking for bigger and bigger terms. Yep. Another just huge key opportunity that we've identified that we've been working on that we hear, there's just crickets in the industry. About Nobody's this. talking about this. It's maddening. <laughs> we call this snippet optimization. The snippet is that rich piece of content that shows up at the top of a search result. And we're finding that more and more, the number changes it seems every month, more and more and more searches are having some sort of rich piece of content, a rich snippet at the top of the, at the top of the search result. The rich snippet pulls a piece of information from the blog post that specifically answers the query. Um, and then it has a link obviously to the blog post itself that created that snippet, that piece of information. We are creating a little piece of content in every single blog post that's intended to be the snippet. And we're finding that when we do that, more often than not, our blog posts win the snippet. Yeah, so this is the cool thing about this is like, so there's nothing you can do like in the tags of your website to say, to like, say I want this to is the answer to that yeah. question. It's, it doesn't work like that. No. It's the, the algorithm is just looking at your blog post and saying, ooh, that sounds like a good answer right there. Yep. And so we wrote the whole blog post, but we found that if we format just one little paragraph in a specific way that meets the length, uh, that we're bolding it, that we're doing, we're writing it in a certain way that really just fits well as a standalone answer there. Not only are we usually winning those snippets in the articles we're, we're writing, a win, like if we're going to be on the page at all, we're usually getting the snippet by doing this and following that snippet op optimization process. But most of the time, Google is grabbing as the snippet the paragraph that we wrote intended to be the snippet. Exactly. Um, like it's, ah, when you think about that, that's incredible. And so snippet optimization, it's crickets in the industry and it's so, so cool. Here's why, because you have to rank for so many different factors and your site is small. You've got to beat the big guys with links and everything else. But if you write the best two sentence summary of this search and you get Google to grab that as the snippet, you, you jump everything. everybody to the top position of the of the search uh, because you had a great two sentences. It's and awesome. So, so when you have a website that's early on and you're writing these response posts and every one of them has a snippet worthy piece of piece of content within that blog post, and so now you get early blog posts that are ranking number one because you have the snippet. Well, how much does that speed up? that growth of credibility, that, that stepped ranking that Google does. How much does that speed up your link velocity, but still in such an organic way of link, of, you know, link building or of gaining backlinks that Google, there's no way they can penalize you because it's 100% organic, it's natural, and it's just safe and long lasting. It's amazing. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Okay, now content is king uh, online. Like, just, if you are just creating a better answer to the question, it's hard for other people to overcome that, that are even similarly sized to mm -hmm. you on the web. So we wanna look at a blog post that does this well. So think about this first. If I were to ask you, go write a blog post about how much a boat weighs. Some of you just thought, oh, Two uh, two thousand words about yeah. how much? Um, <laughs> like that's like a I mean, two hundred word how much is it? Uh, blog post. Five thousand pounds. Yeah, you that's know? it. Like you don't know how to do it. It's hard to think this way. But when somebody goes really in depth and really thinks about what someone who is searched this searching this, what do they need? You know, it's like when you go into Home Depot and they're like. You're asking for something. It's like I don't know how to do the plumbing. Please help me. And they're like aisle seven, and they walk away. It's like. Okay, that didn't, you didn't help me very much, no. right? That's what a lot of blog posts are, Thrill 7. But watch this, look at this post, how well it's done. You go here and it, bang, it's not just, it's ski boat, speed boat, small fishing boat, sailboat, yeah. all the different types of boats that maybe With an you meant. average weight yes, for each one. Yes, it's beautiful. And now we're going to specific models and what they weigh in each of the different categories. 
<laughs> this site is great. Go look at Outdoor Troop. It's one that we sold. This is a really well done website. Um, it, it's a good example. You should be going and checking out the kind of things that they do. Well, and what I love about this post is it takes it even another step further. It's why is somebody looking for how much a boat weighs? Probably because they're thinking about having to tow it. And so they want to know, well, can my truck tow a normal ski boat? And so now in the blog post, there's another table here that says, you know, if you have an F-150 on average, here's about what F-150 can tow. Obviously there's different packages. Here's about what an expedition can tow, you know, and it just goes through those. And then it says, so here's how much weight it can normally tow. And then it goes through, here are the types of boats from my list above that it could tow. As like that one little table has the amount of information that you would find in an entire blog post usually, but it's put into one helpful and extremely convenient table. That formatting is a game changer in making your blog post extremely user friendly. I know it seems silly, like, oh yeah, just put in a table. But there are many times where that type of formatting, uh, maybe it's a table, maybe it's a bulleted list, maybe it's an infographic, but that one thing is so much more helpful than an extra thousand words. And so when that's the case, absolutely do it. So on the same site, we had an, a guest writer who didn't do a good job with an article. This is yep. best and coolest looking life jackets for riding jet skis. When you look at this, like you can tell it's just crap content. Yep. You can tell they've never even put on any of these life jackets. They just got some stock photos and a couple yep. sentences about each one. It's just not that helpful. It's not, it's not the type of content that when you see it, you're like, oh my God. Thank you, that yeah. was awesome, yep. you really helped me. It'd be really nice to know like, okay, uh, this life jacket was extremely comfortable and kind of you know, moves with you and on, when you're jet skiing, that's a really nice feature to have. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's part of best, right? Instead, it looks like they just went through Amazon and found the coolest There's looking pictures. Stuff. And, and, and we see a lot of that type of content in blogs. Um, now, if you're wondering like, okay, but how would I come up with that? How would I come up with the idea to write a blog post that you know, it gives you the weight of boats, but it also adds all these other things. And for that, we've come up with a post recipe. We actually have like a template for what a typical blog post looks like. And what that allows us to do is really just organize the thoughts, come up with the, with the subtopics for a blog post, and be able to put together a good blog post in just a couple of hours. Yeah, because uh, the members of our course were overwhelmed at yeah. one point where we were talking yeah. about everything that should be in a post and we were hearing in the community and the forum for our members, they were saying like, I'm taking eight hours to write one blog post. And when we saw that, we were like, oh my goodness, like if you spend eight hours taking a, writing a post, you're just never going to get the kind of volume of posts that yeah. you're going to need to really succeed. And so we spent a lot of time like, okay, how could we put this into a formula so that when you sit down, your butt hits the seat and you're ready to write a blog post this morning, you're on a mission. You know exactly what to do step, 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 yep. step. And that post is perfectly formatted, it's snippet optimized, and it's written in a way that will help the user. And so that post recipe template has really been huge for us. Um, so go look at our sites and you'll see the kind of content that that, that produces. So there are a lot of these kind of, um, I don't want to say philosophical, but like, it's just like write good content essentially. And we're talking yeah. about different, very important aspects of it. But a lot of people are, want the technical SEO to be the thing that, that gets them ahead. They want to say like, yeah, but what, do I use Yoast or all-in-one SEO, right? And like that's yeah. going to make And what difference. settings do I set on Yoast SEO to launch my website? Yeah, you look others. at other successful blogs and you're like, ah, I know they have a checkbox that I don't have, right? And so technical SEO, we think of more as kind of pass-fail for a lot of the tests, you know? Does your site utilize SSL? Um, does it have an image at all on the page? Is the site speed specific or sufficient enough to be fast to have a good user experience? That's why we created our own WordPress theme called Akabato. That's just lightning you fast. You just nail 100 on the page speed <laughs> insights test. It's awesome, it's called Akabato. Um, a lack of malware on the site, easy to navigate, URL length, is it mobile friendly? Are there a bunch of broken links on the website? Is it over optimized with a bunch of spammy affiliate yeah. links? Yeah. Plagiarism issues, schema markup. There's so much of this technical SEO that we just, 
We want you to use some common sense uh, as you're doing these things. SSL, you gotta have. You should have an image on your page, just a bad user experience not to, same as mobile friendly. But most of these things, like if you just build the website right, you never have to think about ever again. Yep. And so in the course, we built 60 steps. I know there's like no 60 steps of anything these days. It's like three steps and you're a millionaire, yeah. <laughs> right? Like it, but it's, it like walks you through so that your first 60 days of working on your website, when your butt hits the seat, take this specific task so that we know that this stuff is just taken care of for you. But this is the list. Um, if you're wanting to make sure you're doing okay on these, just at least consider each of these things on your site. There are many technical SEO things that, um, that people will tout say that you have to do. We have watched the analytics and you make a change, does nothing. nothing. You make another change, does nothing. Now today, like Jim said, if you don't have an SSL, we're reaching a point where that's going to hurt you. But adding an SSL isn't going to give you some bump in traffic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. And so Jim talked about building your website the right way from the start. That is what we teach in Project 24. Um, that is, I mean, Project 24 is full of courses. Um, it, is, it has an amazing community of people that are helping one another with every step along the way. Uh, we have a podcast in Project 24 where we're talking about the latest things and the latest techniques that we're using to build our websites right from the start. And what Project 24 does for many, many people today, hundreds of people, is it teaches them how to build their site right from the start and it saves them months and even years of work of doing it wrong or doing it almost right and it allows them to get to success so much faster. And what we found is if we can help somebody get to success just one month faster, it's more than paid for itself. The entire membership has. More than. The goal is that you earn a full-time income from your site. And most people aren't going to succeed yes. at that goal. But a lot of our members are because of the things that they're learning and the mistakes they're avoiding and the years of frustration that we had to go through to learn it on their own that they're getting to bypass. And so if you're going to be investing a lot of time and effort into building a website, it's not going to happen in an hour no. or two. Uh, this is a lot of time. You're building a business. Uh, we want to help you to do it right. So I want you to check out Project 24. It's at incomeschool.com slash project24. Um, it has a, this library of courses, the 60 steps. It has tools like you'll, we made your WordPress theme for you uh, and affiliate plugins for you. Uh, we have uh, the community where you can go in and ask questions every time you need help and a weekly podcast where we'll show you what's working right, right now, now. Uh, for us. So it's an incredible membership of what we're providing for you for a really reasonable cost. But you know what? If that's not in the cards for you, don't let it stop you. That's why we have why this we have YouTube this. channel <laughs> because we want to help everybody yeah. to get going. And so that's why in this webinar, we're showing so much of just the base fundamentals because we want you to build your website right. So we want to talk about off-page yes, SEO absolutely. Now. So off-page SEO is like, okay, you've done everything you can with your content, your site structure, all that stuff. And now still that site can lag behind. And we built a website called sevenyearolds.com. We were specifically testing a couple things in Google and so we were not sure if this site would work at all. Uh, with uh, We can talk about later, but we we're, were testing some kind of fringe topics on Google. Um, and the site was toast yeah, for a long time. Super slow. I mean, yes, the growth is positive, but Ooh. barely. And when you compare it to other sites. doctor, there yeah. is life. We started at the same time we, with these other sites and they just poof, took off. So we tested a few theories. and So, so <laughs> we were starting to think like, yeah, okay, so we've learned something. We, we thought it might not work because of these things we were testing with kind of medical content, uh, very risky kind of content. Um, and then we shared it. We shared it on YouTube, this case study. One time, one video. Just shared it and we sent a flood of traffic because people went over to go look at it. And all of a sudden, even after the spike disappeared, we started to rank organically. Yeah. Posts that were ranking five, seven, not at all, were shooting up in the rankings and we started to get organic Google traffic from it. I'll and point out that that is not something we did with the other sites. Yes, we that's built exactly these what sites without say. sending them that flood of traffic. 
in order to test what works organically. Yeah, when we say we built a portfolio of sites, we know we have a big audience that we can't send to those sites. Yeah. We start them from scratch with not sending an audience so we don't have any unfair advantages in knowing what you guys exactly. are gonna be going through when you're building a site. Okay, but that was an example of off-page promotion of a site. Your reputation online matters very much to Google. It's like, I, so I ordered the, the Cybertruck. As soon yeah. as that, people, I mean, say what you will about it. When I watched that announcement, I was like, how fast can I order yeah. to get in front of everybody else? The form else? needs to open now. And so, I mean, it was a train wreck. Yeah. The, the, I mean, and a lot of people would say even the design, but the... The demo. The demo yeah. was a train wreck. They threw the ball and like, look how strong our glass is. They throw it and it just shatters. Like it was a disaster, <laughs> right? But then hundreds of thousands of people immediately put up money to buy it. To pre-order that truck. Why is that? If that would have happened to Ford with their new electric vehicle, ah, it would have destroyed it. But, but Tesla can get away with everything because of the reputation that they've developed. People like Elon Musk, people like the green energy that they're doing, people have driven a Model 3 and they're like, holy crap, this thing is awesome. Amazing. And so when they make a misstep, their reputation is so strong that they still are building up steam. And I would point out that with Tesla, just like with you and anything you build, the reputation is very strong among a large, a certain group of people. There are many other people that saw the Tesla Cybertruck and said, this is stupid. no, this is stupid. This is ridiculous. And they're going to hate. They don't like Elon Musk. They don't like anything Tesla stands for. And you I know? don't like the and, earth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and lithium batteries are the devil and all sorts of that kind of stuff, right? You don't have to please everyone. But the point is, it's important to establish a reputation within an industry and at least within a certain group of people within an industry. And if you can have that reputation on your website, of your website, then it allows you to stand out, um, especially in some of these really important topics that are so I, important to Google. I bought a smoker, like for smoking meat. Yeah. I've been kind of getting into it. And there are a whole bunch of websites on smokers. I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens, right? And so Google says, ah, oh, man, all these websites have written about what's the best wireless thermometer for smokers. They all kind of use the same words. They all have about the same number of backlinks. Who's the guy? Like yeah. who is the guy or gal? Which site is the one that like really has the goods here? And it's like, oh, maybe it's the one that keeps getting spikes of traffic from social because people really like it, yeah. right? And so if you're building a blog, I. I would almost just not recommend at all that you only build a blog anymore. I want to see you spending some of your time building a YouTube channel where you can send floods of traffic over. Go sharing your posts on Pinterest and Reddit and doing some of these things outside of just blogging to just market your website. It's just good marketing. And when Google sees those things, they're like, wow, a lot of people mention this site on social. A lot of people link to this website. And that's how you get links, right? Is you participate yeah. in the industry and you're out there all the time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden your website just has this invisible hand behind it that when you write the post that's eh, about the same as the other guys, yours is the one taken off. This is a very different approach than the link building approach. Mm -hmm. The link building approach typically is, I just gotta get links from anywhere and everywhere. Um, and so, oh, it's so it's sad like, to watch how people do this. Oh man, and some of the spammy garbage tactics that actually don't work and hurt your website are still being used today, which is crazy. Oh, yeah. But some of the more legitimate tactics are things like writing guest posts for other blogs. Let me tell you something. You could spend hours a day emailing 300 other website owners every single day. Begging them to Soliciting them to write, post. to just let you write a post for them. And a lot of them are just going to ignore you. The ones who don't ignore you, most of them will say, well, how much money you got? Mm -hmm. And that is not a legitimate approach to building links. And if Google figures out that was the approach you took, then again, manual penalty on your website. Which happens a lot. A lot of time. Trading links, like, oh, I'll link to your article here and you link to my article there. They see much of that. Again, it hurts you. You can spend a lot of time trying to get the links to game Google's test, to try to trick Google into thinking you have authority. Or you can go participate in your industry. Writing an occasional guest post makes sense, 
but only if it's something you can do legitimately, organically, and yeah, you, met you don't somebody spend at a, forever on. You met somebody at an industry conference, and you're like, hey, could I write a guest book? Yes, sure, why it's not? So it's so much easier when you meet people, yeah. right? But we, yes. uh, we receive dozens of emails a day, and we work hard to hide our email address, but dozens that are like, um, you have a broken link here. Wouldn't it be nice if you switched it to my site? And yeah. this is like when I go around the industry, when I listen to podcasts and YouTube channels, this is what everybody's That's teaching. What teaching. Spend half your time writing content, half your time spam, mass, junk, crapping, emailing the world, hoping that they're going to link to you. And so we decided to do something radical yeah. a few years ago that we just said, what if we just do what Google's asking us to do? What if we just do normal marketing tactics that even if Google didn't exist, we would still do it, make a and, YouTube channel of and interest doing in it, you know? A fairly minimal amount of those, actually. Yes. Um, it, Mostly focused on just writing creating content. content. If you spend 50% of your time creating content and 50% of your time promoting it, and I spend 95% of my time creating content, mm -hmm. I either have twice as much content, twice as many opportunities to rank, or I have content that's twice as good. And that's really a key here. So does it work though? Can you still get the links? Well, we just looked at the backlink profile for one of our sites that was still fairly new. And it had thousands of links that we did nothing to yeah. create. One so blog post, huge. one blog post with 2,500 links to it. And we did no active link building. At all. If you're creating great content, people will naturally link to it. Just like you as a blogger naturally link to people. And so it, it, it works, I promise it works. Just create the content, put it on that blog, spend most of your time focused on creating incredible content, and then just do some marketing naturally for your website the way that you would normally, forgetting about links and Google at all. It yeah. works. Now there are some industries where that outreach becomes more important, where establishing this reputation becomes much more important. Um, a couple of years ago, Google coined the term YMYL, your money, your life. And it was, these are just like those highly important topics where if the information is wrong, it has a major impact on a person's life. Yeah, if I Google my left arm is numb and my heart is beating really fast, <laughs> it doesn't want to send you to a post about like, oh yeah, you should take an ibuprofen and go to bed. Yeah. Like, no, you have, you're having a heart attack. Go yeah. to a hospital, right? And so it really matters some of these searches or how do I do a 401k rollover, right? Like, oh yeah, you messed that up and you could owe hundreds of thousand dollars in taxes. And so Google is being careful with some searches in some categories to make sure it's going to someone with a good reputation because if they have a good reputation they're probably getting it right. Now one thing I would point out is what was your money your life? YMYL used to be your money your life, right? Now it's your money, your politics, your shopping, your news, your religion, your education, YM, YL, and your YP, life. YN. And it's all of these things and I am just shocked that they haven't included your pets mm -hmm. and numerous others that are probably just around the corner. But we have a strong belief that it's not black and white, mm -hmm. that there's a spectrum. It's not like this topic is YMYL and this one is not. It's, do you fall in the bucket? Do yeah, you not fall in the bucket? It's how YMYL is this topic. It's a gradient. Yes. I could write shopping-based topics that are not anywhere near as important to just nail as the heart attack question, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is a spectrum there. But the important thing is that more and more topics are so are topics where Google is specifically looking at the reputation and the authoritativeness of the author and of the website in order to determine who ranks. So because Google is focused on this, we really want you to take time to create a good about me page. Talk about the credentials you have, your experience on the ground doing it, even if you don't have official credentials. We want you to uh, you know, participate with others in the industry and create media like YouTube and stuff so they can see there's a community outside of what you do. Go get interviewed on a podcast. Yes they're going to link to you, you know, go email podcasts and say, I'd love to be a guest. You know, that makes sense when you're in an industry where you have to have some kind of reputation. Exactly. We, this is all what feeds into that EAT that we talked about at the beginning. We've, we've talked a lot about EAT. We actually have an entire webinar on our YouTube channel here about EAT that you can go learn from. We also have 
a f like step by step by step course of 25 like steps all these different things that you can go do to establish eat for your website as part of project 24. it's very important for many industries now to establish that it's just going to give you a leg up over all of the other bloggers who can't establish eat because realistically they don't have any there is so much we've covered in this in this webinar. If you're not subscribed to the Income School YouTube channel, that's what this whole channel is all about. It's about building content online that can earn you an income by monetizing it. It's about building a great YouTube channel, about building blogs. We talk about SEO. That's if you like this video, you're going to like our channel. So be sure to give us a, a subscribe and I mean, if you'd like us, like us. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but we want to cover a couple uh, questions that people often ask uh, when we kind of present this information. Uh, first one is, how good does a site's page speed need to be? What I would say is don't obsess about it because we already have for you. Like we, we did just for fun. We created the fastest WordPress theme. It's called Akabato. Um, and you install it and follow the steps and you will be 98, 99, 100 on Google's page speed insight score. It is stupid fast. Yep. But you know what? If you're 70 on Google's page speed insight score, you're fine. Don't obsess about this. Yeah. You know, even if you're 50, it's like you're probably okay. Do some common sense things to speed it up. But going from 50 to 51 isn't going to improve your rankings. Going from 20 to 50 to 70, okay, yeah, you could see benefits, especially long term as Google just sees this is just a better experience. I would point out that there are some massive websites that are ranking very, very, very well with extremely slow pages with very, very low page speed scores. And the reason they still rank well is because they just have massive EAT. I'm talking about yeah. sites like CNN.com. Forbes. Who's, oh. Yeah, these guys get scores like four on mobile page speed score. It's just ridiculous. Yet they rank well because they're but well established. Most new sites, you're not gonna get a you're not gonna get away with that. No, you're You've not. You've got to take every advantage you can get. Are there SEO tools that are worth paying for? As we mentioned, Ahrefs is one that I really like. It's actually we, has I a use ton it for a lot of stuff. things, just not search analysis, which yep. is what most people use it for. But if you're doing technical SEO, you need to look through a backlink profile and stuff. It's an amazing tool. Yeah. But really, for starting your first blog, eh, I'd probably say no. You just don't need it right now. Right now, you need to create great content and just move on. Does, Does my site need schema markup? Um, for a lot of industries, I'm just going to say it's not pivotal. It's mm -hmm. not It's not super important. If you have a website, though, that's like recipes or, right? news. or news, it's going to be much more important. You just won't stand out at all in the search rankings if you don't have schema. You're going to look just very different from all of the top content. If you are a public figure, if you're an author or something like that, then having some organizational schema is going to allow you to stand out as well when somebody does a search related to you. So depending on your industry, it could be really important. A lot of WordPress themes are not taking schema into account. That's another thing that we've discussed, that we've covered in Akabato. Schema is just completely built in. Um, and so it's really, really easy to just set up, put that information in there and then have it available um, for Google to use. Are you sure we don't need to actively build links? Yes. Um, what about all the people who are still seeing success doing it? Well, because it, it can work. I mean, it's like, you know, can, are there ways that you can kind of game the system? Yes. It's a short term gain um, because Google is often finding out what you've done and it's penalizing your site and destroying the whole business. Uh, so in that sense, it's a short term gain. But also, I don't even know that you can call it a short term gain because if I spend an hour creating a piece of content that is going to organically rank on Google and could bring in 5,000 people a month. Um, and if, if you're ranking that well, an article that's seeing that many eyeballs, it's going to generate, I mean, it could generate hundreds of links to your website, just organic links. Or I could spend that one hour mass emailing the world and hoping that one crappy site will link to me. Like that's just not even a comparison and just, like, yes, you can succeed that way. A lot of very successful bloggers are doing that. And most SEO gurus, that's what they're teaching you. Uh, like, can it work? Yes, it can. I'm just saying it's a better use of your time. It's less risky. And I think you're actually going to have a better link profile by just creating better content. Yep. The by next... spending your time on better content. Yes, exactly. 
Um, the next question is, how can I be certain that a post has been indexed by Google? There's really two places you can go look for this very easily for free. The first one is in Google Search Console. Search, well, just Google Google Search Console and you'll find it. Um, you, if you set up your site, connect it with Google Search Console, they, they'll let you know what you know, what pages are, are, have, have issues, what pages are not indexed, which pages have crawl issues. You can see in there which pages have been indexed. Another really easy way to do it is just using Google search. You just type in site colon and then your URL for your website. And you can either just look through all of the articles or you can just type in the search, the headline or keywords from that article. And just if it shows up there, Google has found it. Mm -hmm. um, that what that site colon URL, what site colon incomeschool.com does is it tells Google to limit the search results to content on this website. And so you can see exactly what content from your website has been indexed by Google. If it's not indexed, it won't show up. Should I leave comments enabled on my posts? Generally, no. Um, you're going to get so much spam, it's crazy. Yeah. And all the plugins trying to prevent it are usually effective for a while. And then all of a sudden you log in, it's like, oh crap, I yeah. got 200 spam <laughs> comments yesterday because somebody found a way around it. Yep. But there are industries where comments can be really valuable, especially like recipes where people can comment, say this worked, this didn't work, etc. where the comments are really providing significant value. And it's a really good way for Google to see which, which recipes, like, there are 47,000 recipes for hummus. Mm -hmm. Which one do I rank number one? Well, the user engagement with the blog post is one of the ways that Google can see which, which recipe people like. Yeah, but outside kind of those specific situations, we just turn them off. It's maybe not as good uh, of technical SEO, but it's like I know how much time it's going to take to to go through these and Moderate keep the spam and out to comments, and yeah. make sure they're actually quality that it's just not worth it. I would rather spend that time creating content. That's our webinar, the Clean SEO Strategy for 2020, and we will see you in the next video.